Every week, it seems like we hear of a new data breach or cyber attack at a large organisation. The truth is that these attacks are even more common at small and medium-sized businesses. Most of us here in this room would have been the victim of a data breach at some point, and yet we're often kept in the dark about why it's such a pervasive problem. The reality is that all of Fordston needs to start taking money from your bank account is a simple combination of data gained from one of these breaches and poor privacy settings on something like your social media account. With these few details in their hands, a fraudster can start setting up a credit card or an online shopping account in your name and start spending. Largely, the way that banks try and tackle these problems hasn't changed for nearly 15 years. They rely on knowing what bad behaviour looks like and trying to write rules to block it. And they do this based on known fraud attacks, on knowing your transaction typical types and details. And in some more sophisticated examples, profiling on mobile devices. But none of this helps protect you from the next generation of sophisticated fraudster. It becomes a constant game of catch-up, trying to find what the criminals are doing and block them. In fact, most criminals are a lot more organised than many people or businesses give them credit for. You might be surprised to hear that they operate like mini businesses or stores. They're trying to make profit from us. There are places online where you can buy in bulk stolen credit cards. You can even get a money-back guarantee if they don't work. <laughs> if you buy more than 10, you might even be given a nice generous discount. And so with fraud happening on this scale, how do we try and outsmart the risk and stop crime? How do we do it by teaching machines to think in the same way that we do, as humans? Well, on one level, it's very simple. We teach them to think in the same way that we do. And to do this, we need to go back to basics. We need to stop trying to predict how a criminal will behave, and instead focus on how you, as a good customer, behaves. As humans, we're incredibly good at understanding behaviour. We naturally do it hundreds of times a day, and we automatically adapt and learn based on what happens around us. And if we spot something out of character, most of us would reach out and try and help. So how do we get machines to think in the same way? To spot when individuals are acting in a way we don't expect, and reach out to try and stop that behaviour doing any further harm? Well, it all comes back to understanding behaviour. Now, what do we mean by behaviour? It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. For some of you in this room, it might look something a bit like this. <laughs> Particularly uh, if you have small children or younger siblings. But an interesting example is to look at parks and green spaces. Now, when planners create a park, they create all the paths within that park. And typically, people will walk along those paths. But what happens when something changes? Say, someone sets up a new coffee shop. Well, very quickly, we'll start to see people change their behaviour. They might try and take a shorter route to get that hit of coffee. And so, a new path will start to emerge. And it's this volatility in human nature that is so fascinating about getting machines to think and act like humans. We can try and put temporary measures in place to stop that behaviour and change it, but, as you can see, it doesn't tend to last for very long, and we find ways around it. And it was this volatility in human nature that fascinated two smart minds at Cambridge University, right here in the UK. The late Professor Bill Fitzgerald and his PhD student, David Sell, were fascinated by how we can get machines to predict, observe and act in the same way that we do as volatile human beings. And this really captured Dave's imagination. And so what he did was he got video footage of 200 people walking on a treadmill. And he ran it through an early version of an AI system using adaptive behavioural analytics. And very quickly, he started to see the machine identify four key characteristics in the data without being told what to look for. And if we start to move the sliders around, we can see how the prevalence of different types of data shows us the underlying behaviour of the character. So we can move it across the male side, 
and we'll start to see more stereotypically male behaviour. <laughs> and if we move it back to the female side, and I should say here this is from the data, we can start to see it walking in a more stereotypically female way. <laughs> Well, what happens if we start to look at more emotional characteristics? Well, here's where it gets really interesting. So here we can see someone who's nervous. You can see how their shoulders are hunched, and they're kind of looking a bit tense as they walk. But what's happened when we stop at a time, point in time here, unhappy? Well, suddenly it's very difficult to tell that difference from nervous. You can probably all see how the shoulders were very hunched. And it's only when we see this figure moving again, when we get that real-time flow of information, that we can see that they've got a bounce in their step. And actually, we can infer that they're happy. And it was this moment that was the breakthrough for Dave Excel. He realized that as humans, this is what we do all the time. And if we can get machines to understand the links between events in real time in the same way, this is the key to getting them to think and then act in the same way that we do as humans. Not only getting them to look at all the events as they happen, but also to contextualize those within our peer groups and within the environment around us. So how does this help in the real world? Well, obviously, I hope that most of you aren't walking around uh, looking at people on treadmills. You might get a few funny looks at the gym if you start doing that. <laughs> but we are watching how people interact with our businesses online, on their mobile devices, in the store. If we look, for example, at the way that someone fills in a form online, we can start to understand a lot about their efficiency. What type of information do they change? How quickly do they know what to type? And from this, we can start to understand the intentions behind their actions, whether they're well-intentioned or, potentially, malicious. <coughs> and so this helps us with today's computer processing power to do this across millions of events in real time, understanding the links between them and building up a unique behavioural profile that is unique to each of us as our fingerprint. But it's much, much harder for a fraudster to replicate. Now, fraudsters aren't in the dark. They know that these techniques exist. But they're trying to make it profitable, as we said earlier. They're looking for the most economical way to try and get to your money and spend it. And so, with these AI systems in their hands, businesses have three key advantages when it comes to protecting you and protecting you from fraud. One, they're typically already gathering the information they need to start building these behavioural profiles. It's nothing you haven't already given to your bank. And two, the best systems are self-learning. And what this means is that they learn and understand and adapt constantly in the same way that we do as humans. And this means they continue to innovate, not just for fraud today, but for tomorrow, and for the day after that. And three, the best systems are using a blend of AI and human understanding to truly spot fraud and crime in the moment it occurs, and try and outsmart those risks. And so today's technology revolution is making it possible for us to fixate on your good behavior, to understand how each one of us behaves, and to use that knowledge to stop crime and to outsmart risk. Thank you very much.